So good morning, everyone. Welcome to this SEPS ECRI webinar on the uh, Consumer Credit Directive Review, uh, Making Consumer Credit Digital Proof. Um, my name is Willem Pieter de Groen. I will be moderating uh, this session this morning and we are accompanied by six excellent speakers, we'll, which I will uh, present the first time they will uh, take the word. Um, today we will discuss uh, various topics and also the debate is organized along these topics. So we first will start with a brief introduction of the CCD by uh, David Silberti from DJ Just, followed by a discussion on the scope of the CCD. Uh, then we will discuss the pre-contextual information and disclosure. Um, then we will uh, move to credit worthiness assessment and then to the market impact. It will be possible for you to ask questions. For that, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'll try to address as many of the questions as possible. Uh, if there are um, too many, it might also be that some of them will be uh, responded to in, in writing rather than uh, by the panelists as such. Um, so if you have a question, please uh, use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We'll now move to David Liberty, who with, which who will introduce uh, the CCD review. David, the floor is yours. Good morning, Willem. Good morning to the panelists and the audience. Uh, first of all, on behalf of the Commission, I would like to thank you for organizing this timely debate, especially with a very appropriate title, meaning the digitalization brought about in the consumer credit market. What I will be doing now in this short uh, next five, four, five minutes is to present the main political objectives pursued by the Commission when it decided in June 2021 to issue a revised Consumer Credit Directive. I will give, first of all, the procedural steps which have led to the actual proposal, and then uh, we will discuss uh, briefly the main, the main uh, important points of this new CCD2. So, uh, as most of you might be familiar with, before the Commission actually proposes a, uh, a new legislative instrument, there is a lot and a lot of studies being done. In fact, the Consumer Credit Directive was, was issued, was agreed in 2008, and since that time, things have changed. In this context, the Commission uh, set out an evaluation and an evaluation study which looked really into what works and what does not work in the current legislative framework. The main, uh, the main result of the, of the evaluation was that indeed the Consumer Credit Directive's main objectives, namely ensuring a high level of consumer protection while at the same time fostering a cross-border uh, consumer credit uh, market, are still valid. So the two objectives pursued currently in the current legislation are two objectives which are also found in the CCD2. However, the evaluation found out that thanks to different changes, such as digitalization, this is why at the beginning I mentioned the importance of this topic, uh, you, that you have uh, pinpointed a precise topic, digitalization has brought in changes which make the legislative framework not necessarily adapted to achieve these two main objectives. There have been other issues and other reasons why the objectives are not reached, such as the COVID-19 pandemic, which has shown a different uh, way and different pattern of how consumers take out credit. Therefore, the main objective of the evaluation was to see what works and what doesn't work. On the basis of that evaluation, the Commission conducted an impact assessment, an assessment of what, what is needed to amend and how the proposed legislative uh, provisions will impact on the market and on the consumer. The impact assessment showed that there is room for improvement and that what can be done is indeed targeting specific areas of the current uh, CCD and also building upon. In fact, uh, one of the main, uh, not let's say slogans, but one of the main uh, examples or phrases which we use during negotiations with the college data is evolution, not revolution. 
why are we speaking about an evolution and rather than rather than a revolution because the bases are quite good so ccd1 works well what we need are improvements and now what are these improvements these improvements regard the issues which we will indeed mention throughout the next uh, next hour and a half so i will not delve into them in much detail but just give you a sort of teaser of what they mean on the scope we have seen and again thanks to digitalization that there might be new products which were not captured under ccd1 which should be captured under ccd2 so therefore in the new uh, proposal which the commission has uh, enacted in, in june 2021 we have a widening of the scope to capture those consumer products which fall currently outside of the scope but which will which ideally will be captured under ccd2 and these the, the reason was indeed because we, we could see that there was a number, these products had an element of consumer detriment. Therefore, the way that these uh, consumer products were uh, are being marketed or are being sold might con re re lead to risks to consumers. Therefore, it was important to ensure that these uh, products fall under the CCD2. At the same time, by making them fall under the CCD2, would be ensuring an equal level playing field, therefore making sure that within the EU there is one set of rooms which apply to the same, uh, to which will apply to the same uh, consumer credit provider. This is why, as I said at the beginning, the objectives of the CCD1 are still valid. We use them for CCD2 and making sure in the scope that, for example, these uh, products would fall under CCD2 which would be beneficial both for the consumer and also for the consumer credit provider. So the scope was one of the main uh, reasons, one of the, one of the main reasons why the commission decided to revise the rules. Again, digitalization and one of the other pillars of the CCD2 is in fact consumer credit worthiness and discussion which we will have later on and which we can also discuss in detail. There in the CCD2, we and the impact of digitalization is taken into account. Therefore, we make sure that the rules concerning the CCD on credit worthiness are up to date and fit for the digital world. Well, how do we do this? Again, evolution, not revolution, by inspiring ourselves from most uh, current EU legislation, such as the General Data Protection Regulation, the GDPR. There have been other instances where uh, we have this evolution or revolution, and we had we looked also on the mortgage credit directive. In the mortgage credit directive, rules such as on advisory services, uh, over indebtedness, these are parts uh, and rules which are found in other legislations which we thought of taking up. Therefore, if I were to summarize now in this short introduction, what the what the uh, what the CCD CCD two does is widening the score scope ensuring that there is credit worthiness and this is done in a much more uh, detailed way because currently the current wording what we have is indeed uh, on the basis of sufficient information so the, the very vague text currently in ccd1 has been qualified by basing ourselves on the mortgage credit directive and thirdly there's a good pillar on uh, uh, ensuring consumer education uh, uh, against the risk of over indebtedness. Therefore, these are the three main pillars politically of the importance of the CCD2, uh, which we will later on have uh, the discussion, uh, have the time to go deeper into each of these topics. So at this stage, I will give you back the floor, Willem, and happy then to contribute on each point even in more greater detail. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, David. Let's immediately continue with the first uh, topic of today, so uh, the scope. Uh, of course, there are now new products being uh, included, at least in the uh, proposed revision, uh, as well as that the thresholds for inclusion have been lowered and also increased. Um, so maybe, David, uh, could you tell us so some more on um, yeah, uh, the, the, the scope issues? Yes, indeed. So, with regards to the scope, the uh, so let let's 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 start from this. So, at EU, so the CCD one is a full harmonization instrument in those areas where it applies. Therefore, if 
loans under 200, so currently loans under 200 euros and above 75,000 fall outside of the scope. Therefore, the obligations on credit worthiness assessment, the obligations on pre-contextual information do not arise at EU level. However, we have seen that a large number of member states with the objective of protecting consumers have already uh, applied the uh, uh, rules of the CCD for uh, loans under 200 euros. So what the commission has done is it has seen in its impact assessment those member states that have already applied certain products, therefore they have already widened the scope. And in that case, we try to replicate the, the best practice found in such member states. Therefore, one example is indeed, we there is no longer in CCD2 a lower threshold of 200. Therefore, in the commission's uh, position and proposal, all products under 100,000 should fall under the consumer credit directive. Therefore, all the obligations found in the CCD2 should apply to these uh, to these products, which for, which uh, would which amount to less than 100,000. Also, for information purposes, the 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 the, the figure of 100,000 is bigger than 75,000, and the reason is to take into take into consideration inflation. So this is this is why the bracket now has been higher, and we see that. There aren't so many uh, consumer loans eh, under 100,000 because most of the time the loans we see are mostly for uh, st student loans, car loans. Therefore, rarely is a loan given over the 100,000. But again, member states who would like can go further and ensure that loans over 100,000 can fall under the protection of the CCD. But at EU level, it's 100,000 below. Then there are other, other uh, instances where we thought that uh, the import, it's important to uh, widen the scope, such as on hiring or leasing agreements. Therefore, this is something which we found in two member states and which we have, uh, which we have also uh, uh, included in the scope. Therefore, there are a number of... Uh, the, the aim, the ultimate aim was indeed to make sure that there is a balance between what is in and what is out. So what falls under the scope and what doesn't fall under the scope to make sure that at the end of the day, while ensuring sufficient consumer protection, the products which are purely national, for, for example, pawn shops. So the, there is a, a, an instance where if we look at CCD on pawn shops, therefore pawn shops are something which is mostly national. It's hardly cross-border. Therefore, the commission did not think it should be subject to the scope of the CCD, just as in CCD1, CCD2 excludes this from the scope. Therefore, the Commission has tried to make sure, while increasing the scope, to make sure that it is reasonable and does not include in its scope all those products, especially those products for which there is limited or no cross-border uh, cross transactions. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, David. We now move to uh, Caroline Ams from Amex. What are your views on the scope revision proposal? Propose? Yeah, thanks, Willem, and, and thanks, David, for that introduction. Um, I think suffice to say that the, the work the commission has done so far has, has really been great. There's been good consultation with, with industry members, and it's no small challenge that they have. I mean, they really need to make sure that these revisions rise to the, the challenge of today's digital world. Um, and there's a lot of balance that I think David talked about, you know, the demands of consumers, technology, innovation, competition, um, all of this really needs to be prioritized within the new rules. And I think all of us on this call, we, we want to see something that will last so that, you know, we're not back here in, in four to five years talking about um, CCD3. Um, so I think, you know, a lot of that thought went into when David mentioned kind of looking at the impact assessment, what works and what doesn't work. And, and now we're in this kind of long process afterwards, um, understanding what member states and, and the European Parliament think about the, the proposed draft. Um, I think the scope is, is a really important uh, point to talk about. And I think, again, as, as David mentioned, it, it was one of the main things, along with creditworthiness assessments, to make sure that the revision really did capture those products which, which pose consumer detriment. Um, and I think in the impact assessment, it showed that there was room for improvement there. Um, I think also given the rise of new products that maybe target certain 
um, consumer populations where maybe it's a bit easier to kind of fall into debt. Again, I think there was kind of a, a broad recognition from consumer groups, um, from politicians as well, that, that the rules needed to be uplifted. Um, and certainly at Amex, I, I think we would you know, easily say that we agree that when there is consumer detriment and if there's data showing this, that rule should apply. Um, but I think the balance of proportionality and nuance in the rules um, is, is really important um, and caution should be taken in writing those rules that when there's a product that doesn't pose a risk, um, that there should again be proportionate rules for those products um, or maybe no rules at all. Um, and I think if we look at CCD one, the current version, um, you know, there are a lot of exemptions and those exemptions, again, I think played a really important role for products when there wasn't an identified risk for them to be subject to a different set or maybe a lighter set of rules. Um, and now uh, in the draft, we've seen kind of the, the wholesale deletion of a lot of these exemptions. And I think maybe that is where the, the balance, as David said, of we're looking for an evolution, not a revolution. Maybe there it's a little bit reversed. Um, and my understanding of, of some of the conversations in the parliament and among the member states is to look to reinsert some of those exemptions. Um, and your question may also be, you know, why is Amex so interested in this point around the scope? Um, so there's a product that, that Amex offers across Europe. They're deferred debit cards. They're also known as charge cards. Um, these benefited from an exemption, which, as I mentioned, has, has now been deleted. Um, these products have existed in the market for decades in Europe, haven't shown uh, a sign of, of consumer detriment, and now would be subject to kind of a full suite of credit rules when sometimes it actually doesn't make sense. Um, and there's a few examples that, that maybe I'll get into later. Um, but I think just to kind of start off this, this um, dialogue that we're gonna have, I think understanding kind of how far we go in the scope and, and how we can best kind of frame that article two um, around what is included to address the nuance of different products and make sure that there is more proportionality. Um, and I think the risk in going too far is that safe alternative products that again, have not been demonstrated to show a consumer detriment would be removed from the market or the incentives to offer them wouldn't be in place. If, if you're gonna be treated as a full credit product, then you might as well uh, provide full credit, which again, does in some case carry risks. Um, and, and I'm sure the commission has done this, but thinking about the outcome and putting the consumers first again, is always a great way to kind of frame it. And, and what will the end impact be for the consumer? Will they still have choice? Will there still be competition among different products? Um, I think that's something really important to bear in mind when, when you have this question around the scope. Thank you, uh, Caroline. We now move to Puizik uh, Cartier-Wu uh, from BNP Paribas Personal Finance. Uh, what are your views on the scope, uh, Puizik? Hello, Willem. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me for this webinar. My view is that uh, we really welcome this uh, new uh, directive proposal, this revision, uh, the inclusion of um, um, and adaptation uh, on uh, the new digital world. But what we think it is that the extension to uh, the uh, extension of the scope of application to leasing should be uh, maybe uh, think through. Uh, because leasing is a total different product. Uh, credit is a loan uh, of money uh, so that the consumer can buy a good. And leasing is a monthly payment to benefit from a use. It is really tricky to define what leasing, what kind of leasing should be included uh, in the CCD because uh, leasing, it can be a, a telephone subscription. It can be renting an electric bike. It can also be uh, renting an apartment each of this product is also leasing. So we think that uh, CCD should uh, only regulate credit activities uh, and not leasing. Um, the CCD, as David has mentioned it, um, wants also to extend um, the, the scope to small credits below 200 euros and uh, those uh, refundable in less than three months. In some countries, it really makes sense and uh, it is really best practices because uh, for these countries, uh, the average salary um, in this country are sometimes just around 600 euros. So uh, 200 euros compared to 600, it, it is really uh, important. 
But in some other countries, uh, they haven't regulated below 200 because we think that the market is uh, fully balanced. And uh, as uh, Caroline said, there is no detriment to consumers for, for some of the countries. So maybe um, I, I think that uh, the, the scope should be maybe more balanced uh, depending on the specificities uh, of uh, each country. Um, uh, besides this credit, uh, are the, the, the small credit below 200 are fa payment facilities allowing consumers most of the time to buy consumer goods, such as uh, replacing a washing machine that breaks down, buying a microwave, and so on. And this small credit enables to spread the expenditure over several months rather than assuming the budgetary burden at once and sometimes finding oneself with an overdraft. So we think that this means of payment are very popular. Uh, with consumers and merchants because they are simple, uh, easy to use, and often at uh, low or zero cost for the consumer. But if the question is whether these payment formulas are risky in terms of indebtedness and that the answer lies in their integration in the CCD, then it is necessary that these products priced with insignificant charges or at zero cost, meaning free of interest, be treated in the same way to ensure level playing field. Indeed, in both cases, the level of debt uh, for the same amount borrowed is almost comparable to a few euros. Therefore, there can be no difference in treatment between these products, here or not, which remain small credit over short periods. Besides, the COVID crisis has accelerated the development of consumer patterns towards more digitalization, uh, an increased search in customer journey for more accessibility, ease, and speed. These operations require a proportionate regime composed of consumer information so that they take the full measure of their commitment and the regime that protects them, even if we do not see any other indebtedness related to these small products. What we propose uh, it is to introduce a proportionate re regime in free part, a, a simple one, communicate the pre-contractual information using the SECO that was uh, proposed uh, by the commission. It is really uh, simple. It reproduces the key characteristics of the credit, uh, display the, uh, the appearance so that the consumer is aware that the credit has a cost and that he knows exactly the cost of its operation, and console the local database uh, to exclude consumers already in financial difficulty. What we propose is that this proportionate regime applies to all credits of less than 200 euro or less than three months with or without fees. Thank you very much, uh, Puise. We now move to Agustin Reiner, representing the Consumer Association, Buk. Thank you very much, uh, William Peter. And hi, everyone. It's really a, a pleasure to be part of this uh, extremely interesting discussion. Uh, I thank you to my, um, my co-panelists for the very interesting uh, comments. Um, so uh, starting first with a general um, observation, of course, credit markets are ideal to measure the temperature of uh, household economies. Um, I happen to uh, grew up in an inflationary economy where people were taking um, loans basically to buy groceries. And this actually shows uh, a correlation between the financial situation of many families as well as the proliferation of new type of um, credit um, credit products, and we have seen that as well in the context of the of the pandemic, uh, for example, uh, with thanks to the digitalization and the possibility to reach out uh, to consumers through multiple um, uh, digital digital means, there have been new type of products like uh, buy now, uh, pay later. Um, pay the loans that have been advertised uh, online, new type of leasing agreements that was mentioned before, allowing consumers, for example, to buy a new fridge or a, or a, or a, or a washing machine, uh, defer um, uh, debit cards, crowdfunding, peer-to-peer -peer lending. So all these new type of products that did not certainly exist at the time uh, when the Consumer Credit Directive 1 uh, was adopted, but that today are uh, becoming extremely popular, which include also products for very small um, uh, amounts. 
And what is also interesting uh, to see is that there is, of course, a correlation between the emergence of this type of products and the um, financial situation of many people in, in the EU, as I said before. So, for example, the Eurostats of October 2021, so last year, one in five in the EU are in the risk of poverty. Also, if you look, for example, at the data by our member, Citizens Advice, our UK member, uh, they not being part of the EU uh, anymore. That reflects the situation of many households in, in, in Europe as well. One in four customers have re regretted using a buy now, buy now, pay later product. Also, our Danish members have shown that um, these type of products are being used mainly by young consumers to buy shoes or clothes or new phones, and then they have a struggle to pay them uh, to pay them back. Um, so, of course, this requires a, a very careful reflection about how then the rules should be adapted, and we are um, very much welcome. Uh, we have welcomed the fact that the, the Commission have decided to reflect that new reality in the um, in the scope of the um, new consumer grade directive and of course i understand the calls for uh, proportionality uh, for this type of um, of loans but i think it's very important to be clear that um, what might seems to be a low loan or a low risk loan for a creditor might still be a considerable loan or a considerable obligation for um, a consumer who is living on a small or, or tight budget. So we need always to keep that in mind that it's always in relation to the specific circumstances of the consumer who is um, seeking the, uh, uh, the credit or more and more that have been proactively approached to, um, uh, uh, to apply for this type of, um, of, uh, of, uh, of financing. Uh, and of course, this all concerns also the scope is kind of the step one to get the, step, the, the scope of application is fundamental. But then what are the consequences of having these products in the scope? And there is when it comes to the whole discussion around credit worthiness assessment, um, which I'm, I'm sure we're going to discuss now uh, very shortly. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Augustine. I'm looking at uh, David, whether you want to respond maybe to any of the previous points? Yes, yes. Uh, I think this has been a very helpful and uh, useful debate. No? So we here for calls for a more uh, proportionate uh, regime. So just to update you a bit more on how things have gone, of course, most of you are familiar now. So the commission issues its proposal, then it is discussed uh, by the co-legislators. Now, with regards to this uh, proportionate regime, what was interesting is that we need to get the titles right. Eh? So when we speak about proportionate regime is one thing. When we speak about a risk-based approach is another thing. So I have full sympathy for people who speak and argue on the basis of risk. Therefore, does, for example, the fair debit card create a risk. Do loans under 200 euros create a risk? That is a valid and legitimate point. However, when we speak, and this has, been, this has become a sort of misnomer within the certain co-legislators, when we speak about proportional regime, in reality, what we're speaking about is a lighter regime for credit providers. Why? Because in this lighter regime, there would be certain articles or no articles at all applicable to that product, to that specific product. So while, of course, the Commission's proposal is not perfect and there are ways and means to improve it, on the scope, when we discuss the scope, we have to keep in mind that the impact assessment inbuilt in it, is, in it has, the, has this proportionality. However, it can be a policy choice, a policy choice, and not a proportional choice, a policy choice by the co-legislators, by one of the co-legislators or by both, to exclude or subject certain products to a limited number of articles or to no articles at all. Now, this is a policy choice. And this policy choice, if gone in, in this direction, needs to be motivated and justified. Therefore, one justification could be indeed the low or inexistent element of risk to the consumer. So I think what is important at this stage is more like a 
philosophical or literal uh, explanation, but we are not speaking about a proportionate regime here, but either on a risk-based approach for certain products or on a lighter regime for certain products. So I think this is the most important thing at this stage. Thank you very much, uh, David. I will now move to our second topic of today, uh, pre-contextual information and disclosure. We will discuss our uh, particular questions like how do we make sure that consumers genuinely understand the nature of the agreement? Is the standard European consumer credit information form adequate to all co consumer credit products? And is uh, standardization in advertisement uh, better versus optimal or uh, personalization? Uh, we start uh, this topic with Martijn Vliegendhardt. Uh, he is representing uh, Klarna. Thank you very much, uh, Willem Pieter. Um, good, good morning, everybody. Um, for those who are not familiar with us, Klarna is a global bank payments and shopping service provider. Our mission is to save people uh, and business money, time, and informed and to be in control. And as a buy now, pay later a products provider, we lend small amounts of money interest-free to consumers who pass our credit worthiness assessment. We were founded in Stockholm in 2005. And globally, we now have over 400,000 retail partners and more than 147 million active consumers making 2 million purchases a day. And we operate in 20 countries. Most of them are in the EU. Now on the CCD, I would like to comment the Commission uh, on the proposal. We support further harmonization and deepening of the EU single market in consumer credit. We support the vast majority of the new CCD proposals, the interest rate cap, the ban on tying practices and ensuring uh, BAPL products are regulated. However, we believe that there are uh, a few important elements that need adjusting to deliver the best out outcome for EU consumers our clients. And one of them uh, is on pre-contextual information and the other is uh, indeed on the credit worthiness assessment. Um, we strongly believe that pre-contextual information requirement must be transparent and presented in such a way that makes sense to consumers. This means using plain language rather than yarn text and focusing on information consumers must know in order to compare the different forms of credit and ultimately, of course, make the informed decision. We pride ourselves on providing clear and concise information that allows customers to fully understand the most important information related to their purchase. And the CCD proposals include a standardized information sheet, the ZECI. Uh, for us, that is unnecessary, irrelevant, or even re repetitive for short-term interest-free credit that we offer. And so, uh, for instance, the information on APRs and the rights to withdrawal in, in, in 40 days. Why? Because our uh, products are interest-free and consumers can withdraw at any time simply by paying the cost of product, product they have purchased. The SECI is a valuable tool for comparing interest uh, bearing and typically longer term fixed sum credit agreements such as payday loans or car financing products or other personal loans, but disproportionate and unhelpful in the context of short-term interest-free credit. Bombarding consumers with unhelpful information is confusing, duplicative, distracting, and discourages engagement with information that really matters. And consumers will quickly learn to ignore these standards notices. Also presenting the SECI and the SECO on the screen of a smartphone in line with the EU objectives for the CCD would be impractical and negatively impact the consumer experience for European shoppers. This could also lead to the unintended consequence, a poor lengthy experience at the checkout because of unnecessary disclosures and irrelevant questions can encourage consumers to use easy, accessible, but more risky and expensive credit. Exactly the opposite of what the review of the CCD envisages. The most important pre-contractual pre requirements in Article 10 of the CCD are already present in our pre-purchase flow including the total cost of credit to the consumer when customers are required to pay and the consequences uh, of not paying on time without the need for all the prescribed SECI requirements. And this information is written in plain language, tested so that an eight-year-old can easily understand. In order to deliver the best outcome for the consumers, 
if we want to have innovative short-term interest-free credit widely available as an alternative to old high-cost credits, the, the CCD should ensure that we must present relevant information to consumers in the pre-checkout phase, but without prescribing a standardized format more suited to long-term interest-bearing credit products. This will allow us to present the information in natural ways that will support better consumer outcomes. Thank you, uh, Martijn. I'm curious also to hear from others how they think about this. Uh, Puisi. Uh, yes, thanks. Um, uh, uh, as it was said many times, um, uh, the world is changing and the consumers are using more and more digital means. So there are, we are, as consumers, are looking for simplicity, speed and ease. So it is necessary to communicate clearly with concise information and ensure that the customer has the means to understand in a short time his future financial operation and what he is committed to. So we really welcome the simplification of pre-contractual information proposed for voice medium, but we think it should be extended to digital medium as well and further simplification should be proposed. So uh, if we see today the SECI, it, is, um, it represents almost three full pages and 21 information, uh, what we uh, can observe uh, is that most of the consumers don't read all of them. So uh, what we think it is a really true improvement in the commission proposal, it is the SECO, because it gathers the six most important pieces of information. The consumer knows exactly what he is committing to, he knows the amount borrowed, the total cost of the credit, and how much he must repay each month. We think that this is enough. And if he would like to uh, have more information, he can uh, go to a website uh, using a, a, a link. Um, there was one of the question that is, how can we ensure that the customer really understands the nature of his approval? It is necessary, we think that it is really necessary to strengthen education that so that each consumer understands that a contract is a commitment, a legal commitment, and also uh, financial education must be strengthened as well. So we really uh, welcome the introduction of uh, uh, the increase of financial education in the commission proposal so that every consumer knows how to manage his budget. We think that when a consumer signs a contract, it means that he understands his commitment, that he understands that he must repay the money borrowed. Um, we also think that the one day cooling period could be very detrimental for consumers and for the merchants, as it will force the consumer to come back to, fin to finalize its purchase and its uh, credit uh, agreement. The consumer has already 14 days to reflect and reconsider his commitment. Besides, the information on the right of withdrawal is already in the SECI and in the contract. So imposing the reminder will lead to cost for lenders with no proven benefit for consumers. At least if we want to really introduce more digitalization in the CCD2, uh, the reminder um, should, be, should, be, uh, should be introduced, but, but um, we uh, should in, enable to send a reminder by using text message or, or email. Thank you, Prizi. So we have heard uh, some uh, demands in saying that it, or at least indicating that the current uh, proposal is uh, not fit for purpose in the sense that it's not addressing all the uh, different information that would be logical potentially for particular uh, products, uh, that the information might be uh, potentially go, be more simplified, uh, as well as that the way it's presented is not uh, appropriate, at least for also digital channels. How do you think about this, uh, Augustine Reiner? Thank you. Um, we, we all know that financial services um, and in particular um, consumer um, credit markets are among the most kind of complex products that consumers access. So it's not new that uh, the legislator had to intervene in the past in trying to streamline the information that consumers are um, being given, trying to make this information comparable, trying to understand the consequences of uh, borrowing money. Uh, and sometimes this intervention has not been uh, so successful in the sense that uh, many times simply 
consumers do not either take the time to read the information or that simply cannot understand the information this provider or the information is provided under circumstances that do not allow the consumer to process the information and understand the consequences of uh, borrowing money. So, of course, at the same time, we need to avoid the risk of creating information overload, which will have the same effects of not providing information at all. So the idea of having key information to be provided on the uh, first page of the standard European consumer credit information form, I think this is a, uh, an important uh, step forward. It's crucial that consumers understand clearly what are the implications of borrowing money, what are the implications of not paying, paying back uh, the money um, uh, as well. Um, so therefore, um, I think that the, um, the fact that the, 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 the Commission is improving this, uh, this, this rule or seek to improve this rule is, a, is an important uh, step forward. However, pre-contractual information is extremely important in order to be able to make an informed decision, as we know. But then there is also the other side of the story, which relates to any claims that are made before you enter into a contract, so in the advertising phase. And something that digitalization has brought us, and particularly to the um, credit providers, are the possibility also to reach consumers through many different means. And we know that advertising of uh, credit is literally everywhere. You have stars, uh, movie stars, uh, music stars, and doing commercials. Um, IKEA, MediaMark, and others are offering payments um, in installments. Uh, we have radio and TV advertising, social media advertising. So basically, people are bombarding with these uh, opportunities. Of course, uh, if you compare how this information or how this uh, practices are presented to consumers is much more attractive than then reading your pre-contractual information and then realizing what are the consequences of borrowing money. Um, so, of course, you know that has a big influence on consumers' behavior to go for this type of, of products. Um, also, think, for example, of what we call uh, uh, dark uh, dark patterns that sometimes even consumers are not into taking into taking credit. So, for example, um, buy now, pay later is presented in many circumstances as a default option at checkout, at least if you have already uh, used this um, this um, uh, payment and, and credit and, and credit option. So here we think that it is extremely extremely important. Uh, to pay as much attention um, to advertising as we are doing to the pre-contractual um, uh, information. Um, and then um, going back to the pre-contractual information uh, requirements there, uh, what is clear is that the, the, for us, the total cost of the credits needs to be upfront. Consumers need to be able to understand that when they're borrowing money, this costs money and how much this will cost them. Uh, so this is, of course, uh, central uh, for us, and this will be something that needs to be permanently um, in this place for the, for the consumer. And then another element that we might also need to consider in the, in the debate, which concerns directly digitalization, is the use of data for personalized advertising around consumer credit. Uh, well, of course, we have the GDPR uh, in place. It has also some limitations, and financial service has its particularities. Um, so we might need also to reflect about uh, how to tighten up the, the, the rules when it comes to advertising of um, credit products. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Augustine. Um, maybe there was one clarifying question for uh, Martijn. So um, are you advocating for not or applying the SECI or uh, for basically changing it to an alternative template or uh, deferring it to uh, supplier information formats. Yeah, thank you very much for the for the question. Uh, I think what what is most important is that the, that the consumers get the the, the the key information up front. Uh, in the in, in uh, so I explained that we are doing that already right now. Uh, so the, the the key information that they are really uh, clear what what they are entering into. Uh, we have uh, also. Um, put a video online which I can share in this uh, in this chat where you know, people can uh, can see how we are um, looking at it in uh, in real contract of um, concrete terms. So I will I will also uh, share the link in, in the chat. Thank you, Martijn. 
Uh, David, uh, we have heard, of course, a, a lot of different elements uh, on which different stakeholders have some um, reservations. Um, what is your response to this? Thank you. Thank you, Willem, and thank you to all the uh, previous panelists for their comments. Uh, let me start by this. So the objective pursued by the Commission and its proposal is quality, not quantity. So therefore, we want quality information to reach the uh, consumer. Quantity means overburdening the consumer. And this is something which the, consumer, which the Commission clearly does not want. Now, when we proposed the SECI, and on the basis of the evaluation, we found out that the SECI works well. However, we tried through the SECO to make things even closer to our principal objective of ensuring quality, not quantity. Now, clearly, uh, it, we don't have a perfect text. The text is not a bulletproof. Therefore, we are engaging with the college data to ensure a text which really brings the principle of quality, not quantity, into concrete application. Therefore, on that point, clearly, there can be uh, room for improvement. But as long as this objective of quality is, and not quantity is, uh, is reached, therefore the Commission is willing to go and go that way and even improve the text. There was also an interesting point on the one day, uh, one day um, provision of the, the, so another issue which we found out concerns the time between the provision of pre-contextual information and the actual signature. Those familiar with the current CCD know that the wording in the CCD is quite fluffy. It is quite vague. It states, in good time. Now, in good time can mean a lot of things. What we found out in the evaluation and the impact assessment is that in 40%, in 40 of the times, in good time meant at the same time. Therefore, you are first given the SECI. One second later, you are given the contract and you sign. So the objective of transparency and comparability, which the pre-contextual information uh, articles pursue, are lost since the consumer clearly in one second does not have sufficient time to uh, analyze what, this, what is there in this pre-contextual document. Now, this is why the commission thought of having a decalage of 24 hours of one day between the provision of the set of the pre contextual information and the actual signature. Now, we understand, and it's clearly not the commission's intention for the poor person who takes the bus, goes to a, I don't know, a supermarket, a hypermarket outside of the city, takes a loan, or needs to buy, I don't know, his wife's birthday. So let's imagine Saturday morning. It's my wife's birthday. I go, I take the bus. I go to the supermarket outside the city, 20 minutes of bus. I go there and then it tells me, listen, you have to come again on Monday because the document, the, because there needs to be one day between the pre-contextual information and the actual signature. Of course, this is not how things work in life. And clearly my wife will be extremely unhappy if I go back on Saturday without a present. Therefore, what the commission has done, it has, in the second paragraph, provided the possibility of giving the, the pre-contextual information at the same time or nearly at the same time. But then there's this obligation to provide the right of withdrawal subsequent to the signature of the contract. Therefore, there is a sort of afterward, uh, afterward warning that there's this pre, there's this right of withdrawal and making sure that this right of withdrawal, the information of the right of withdrawal reaches the consumer. Again, the mechanism of how this works can be improved, but what we need to avoid, and it will be a very, very missed opportunity for the CCD2, is if we revert back to in good time, which would mean that at least in 40% of the instances, the, the objectives pursued by the pre contextual information are lost because in good time, time means at the same time. So this is something which the Commission clearly will defend until the end to make sure 
that the objectives pursued by the pre-contextual information reaches adequately and sufficient time to the consumer. So, David, may I ask you an additional question related to, uh, in particular, what, what uh, came up as well is on the appropriateness of the uh, standard information for the different, uh, say, platforms to which or uh, technologies to which uh, credit is offered. Uh, uh, what is your view on that? Uh, responding to, for yeah. instance, uh, mobile uh, uh, agreements, etc. Yeah, no, no, I think this is, the, so when we did the impact assessment, I think, I can't remember now, it was more than a year, more than a year ago, but at one point to go, you need to swipe, I think up to 30 times a mobile phone frame. So the more you need to swipe 30 times to read the whole Seki. Clearly this is, uh, this would defeat the purpose. And this is why we came up with the idea of the Seko at the beginning. Therefore, what we need to make, what we try to make sure is that the quality information is uh, easily displayed on the screen, and then you can go and further, uh, further, further find further information later on. But it is true that we have consumer behavioral studies which show that the current Seki takes, I think, 30 swipes or 28 or 32 swipes to read it completely. This is why the Commission's aim of quality, not quantity, and why the Seco was coming at the beginning. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, let's now move to the next uh, topic of today is maybe the most discussed one, uh, the credit worthiness assessment. During this uh, short debate, we will be uh, trying to answer the following questions. Are the revised requirements fit for purpose? Are they sufficiently proportional? And do they improve the consumer protection as well as is the data sharing aligned with the data protection rules or at least sufficiently? Uh, we start with Caroline from Amex. Thank you. And uh, David, I hope it, it doesn't seem like we're all coming after um, the great work that the commission has done on, on the first draft. I do not envy your job of um, having to take on board all of the, the different points here. I, I think on this one, it's, um, again, important to kind of go back to what we're trying to achieve and what the outcome is. I think the challenge in getting there, though, is, is again, balancing um, what serves the consumer, what information is available, how is it going to be accessed? And, and is it actually going to be used? So to make sure that the information that's being gathered is, is being actioned um, in a right way. And, and I think, um, again, kind of going back to the principles of, of what we're trying to achieve, it should be focused on ensuring that products that are given to consumers at the end of the day are really kind of fit for their scenario, but that there's also choice and, and a kind of consumer element in um, then making a decision and, and kind of taking out the, the product on that. I think with the consumer, or sorry, with the credit worthiness assessment, Caroline? What's great is that right now we're living we in a very for 10 seconds. environment. Yep. Yeah. Uh, okay, um, I'll just go back. So I, I was just saying that we're, we're living in a very data rich environment now. And um, that gives us a great opportunity to leverage different data sources for consumers, but also a challenge. And I think you alluded to this in um, the risk or the challenge of balancing, you know, the information we should pull for credit worthiness assessment with other rules like GDPR. And I think there's still some work to be done to make sure that those two pieces of legislation and kind of rules on data are, are really communicating with each other and that we're not going a step too far and kind of um, infringing on privacy and other concerns that we would have in, in taking out credit worthiness assessments. I think one point that I'll just um, congratulate, again, the, the commission on, I think it's a really important distinction that they've drawn in the draft, and it's about broadening access to um, credit databases and saying that it should be non-discriminatory one challenge that Amex has had, um, we're registered as a payment institution, and we haven't always had the same kind of unfettered access to credit databases. Sometimes these are um, more used for those that hold credit licenses or banks, um, and ensuring that payment institutions and others can also have access to these sources of information. I think that's really gonna be a good first step in um, leading to a place where again, 
providers can access the data that's available and use that to make kind of actionable, safe decisions about products that are available to consumers. Thank you, uh, Kai. I'm also interested to hear later on what Ole Schroeder from Schufa has to say on your uh, to your last point. But first, we move to uh, Martijn Vliegenthardt again from uh, Klarna. You mentioned you had basically two comments or two reservations with the current text, and this would be the second one. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Will Peter. This is indeed the second one. And, and again, um, let, let me be very clear. Indeed, the Commission has done a great job and it's not like a bashing uh, that I want to do here. Um, certainly the opposite, I would say. But um, a thing that I want to stress is uh, the um, we believe it's it's best to prevent over deadness in deadness problems before they occur, of course, uh, which is why we assess affordability for every purchase and the creditworthiness of our, of our customers. Uh, they change over time by concluding a robust creditworthiness assessment on each and every transaction that we do. In real time, we are well positioned to judge their ability to pay. Our business model is predicted on people that pay us back uh, in full and on time and because we don't charge interest or late fees. So we have a strong incentive to only lend to those who can afford to repay. Um, and I think it's also important for Augustine from, from Berg to, to, to mention that unlike other credit uh, providers which allow consumers to borrow thousands of euros, we only lend very small amounts to new customers for their first purchase. And if you show you can uh, pay back on time, uh, we, will, we can lend more. Uh, and, and consumers who do not meet the repayments are restricted from further use of our products. I think that's really relevant to, to mention in this. Uh, we believe that creditworthiness assessment should prevent irresponsible lending practices and over indebtedness and, and should take into account uh, or into consideration all necessary and relevant factors that can influence a consumer ability to repay the credit. However, the requirements uh, of Article 18 are not proportionate to the level of risk that short-term risk, short-term interest-free uh, uh, credit poses a full income and expenditure assessment as proposed by the commission should not be necessary for consumers looking into buy now pay later uh, value everyday items such as a 90 uh, euros pair of jeans or uh, on, on short term interest free credit uh, 90 euros is, is our average value of, uh, of, a, of a purchase by the way as the proposal stands, the customer would be blocked from completing their intended uh, transaction pending completion of necessary checks, uh, which could take several days. Um, and in some member states, it would require information to be provided manually even uh, by the consumer themselves. So this slow, intrusive process would significantly hinder consumers looking to transact in an online environment and causes uh, real consumer harm by driving them towards more expensive forms of lending. Without the presence of interest uh, or fees, uh, there's a neglectable risk or possibility of consumers becoming trapped in a debt spiral. A uh, fundamental difference between short-term interest-free credit that we uh, offer and, and other products such as payday loans or credit cards. We therefore believe that a proportionate approach to the credit worthiness assessment would be appropriate given the low average spend, low default rates. For us, it's less than 1% and low cost or zero cost nature of our products. A proportionate regime would still allow for effective consumer protection and ensure consumers are able to access low risk, low risk credit products in preference to other high cost credit. The simplest and most proportionate approach, uh, proportionate approach would be no mandatory requirement for income and affordability assessments and hard checks for uh, short-term interest fee credit. Lastly, um, it's important that regulations on credit worthiness assessment are aligned with the data protection rules, as there are competing interests at stake, i.e. data protection rules are moving towards a more restrictive approach for companies to collect, store and use data, whereas the credit worthiness assessment uh, regulations are requiring us to, to use more and more data points in making our assessments. So um, having national Debt registers is a good way of ensuring that creditors have accurate data available and being able to make the best credit worthiness assessment decisions uh, possible and where we can use external databases to bolster uh, our internal affordability analysis. Uh, we do so, of course, but uh, this isn't possible in, in all EU countries. 
And I want to echo what previous speakers also said. Uh, what would really help is an improved quality and real-time access to credit directory data available in real time across all EU member states. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Martijn. Let's move to Prizi from <laughs> Thank you. BNP Paribas Personal Finance. Yes, I, I fully join the other panelists. Uh, we really welcome the, the, the job done by con the Commission. So we are here to debate on the point on, on which uh, we would like a, a, a bit more improvement. But of course, we are not here for, for bashing or, 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 or criticizing in any way, uh, because uh, we, we truly think it, it, it was a, a, a huge and, and great job on that. What we think it is, as, we, as I have mentioned before, it is that for small credits, we think that uh, a proportionate regime should be introduced. Uh, of course, if there, if there is any risk regarding this credit, it should be reinforced. Uh, the credit worthiness assessment should be reinforced. But what we can see on, on the market is depending on countries, uh, if the country has not uh, regulated this product, it means that uh, they don't consider this product as being uh, really risky. But what we think it is that um, um, th this proportionality could be optional depending on countries, uh, because uh, some countries have already applied the framework from the first euro borrowed, but in some other countries, it does not make really sense to uh, make a full and thorough credit worthiness for 200 euros. And what we also think uh, it is that um, to really protect uh, the consumer, uh, we have to ensure a real level playing field, meaning that in one national uh, territory, uh, the same regime should be applied for uh, short-term credits, uh, small credits with or without charges, and for every actor providing these credits, whatever is uh, their status. Um, on the granting of credit, we can see uh, by the Parliament some amendments that have been proposed to enable only the granting of credit in case of positive credit worthiness assessment, or to enable, uh, in case of negative credit worthiness, the granting of credit only for certain categories of consumers or for healthcare expenses. What we think is that the CCD should absolutely remind that there is no right to credit that lenders should not be forced to lend whatever the result of the credit worthiness is. And of course, the consumer should be informed of the credit refusal, but should not be able to contest the decision. Um, regarding the right of withdrawal, uh, the consumer, of course, can reconsider his decision, uh, but we think not forever. So a limitation of time should be set starting either from the date of the signature or from the moment the right of withdrawal is provided. Some amendments in the parliament proposes six months, a year, two year um, of duration. And we think that is quite a lot to reconsider one decision, knowing that each month you have to repay uh, the loan. So if I just take the example of a credit linked with a car, if the consumer is entitled to one year with Roto, it means that he can use the car for free for one year, then return the car, get the credit refunded, and the car dealer will have to take back a car that has lost between 15 to 30% of its value. So we need to find um, a, a balanced, uh, I would say, uh, protection for consumer uh, but also uh, something that is balanced for lenders as well. Only one word on the use of data. Um, it is already regulated by uh, the EBA guidelines on loan origi origination and monitoring and on the GDPR. Uh, so the provisions are redundant with those uh, that already exist. So we don't think that it's useful to, to put it back again uh, in this directive. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Prizi. And now I will introduce the last speaker uh, from uh, this uh, panel. So that's Ole uh, Schroeder from Shufa. And of course, after uh, Ole, we will come back to Augustine from Buke and David from DJ Just. Um, 
Ola, we have already heard from the previous panelists the importance of uh, so basically the service you deliver in providing uh, data for the creditworthiness assessment. Uh, what are your views uh, on the Commission proposal in this regard? Thank you very much. Um, yes, data and human consumer protection um, have a strong focus in this um, CCD review. We appreciate this. However, consumer protection and data um, protection are not always in line and to, to protect consumer from over indebtedness, it is necessary to get access for many different databases, what allows them to evaluate the credit version as accurate. And, and this um, is of course, um, yeah, questionable in, in regard to data protection. So we, we, we have to balance out um, these um, different goals. As I mentioned, um, the quality of credit worthiness assessment is decisive to protect the consumers from over indebtedness and to increase their access to credit market. Thus, um, to fulfill um, this target of consumer protection, it is um, necessary not only to hinder lenders and credit agency, agencies to process special kinds of data, but also to oblige the lenders and credit agency explicitly to process um, data. Thus, the directive, um, respectively, the Implementations Act should provide a, a legal basis to access these data. And um, this is also important to um, be in line with the um, general data protection regulation. Um, it is therefore positive that Article 18 of the um, CCD review clarifies that the assessment of credit worthiness shall be carried out on the basis of relevant and accurate information on the consumer's income and expenses and other financial and economic circumstances and so on. But a specification on the categories of the personal data for credit um, worthiness assessment does not increase consumer protection. Assessing a person's credit worthiness is not an exact science to reduce inaccuracy. A comprehensive picture has to be available and a further specification would limit innovation to find ways how to um, financial include consumers with no or limited credit history. Um, we have now, for example, the possibility with the, um, with the regulation to get access um, to, for example, other um, databases. Data sharing um, should not be limited um, by the um, consumer, by the CCD, by constitute blacklist. We should avoid double over-regulations. Article 9 of the GDPR already regulates that health data or any other information with special protected characteristics such as race, sexual orientation cannot be used. Um, for credit worthiness assessment and to secure the highest standard of data protection, the GDPR provides already a profound scope of regulation. And um, therefore, um, the lenders already must comply with um, the general data protection regulations. Lenders are further regulated by sectoral legislation for the financial sector. And um, yeah, therefore, if the directive prohibits um, the use of special data categorization on the one hand, it should give a, on the other hand, a, a legal base to process um, the data um, which are necessary. A comprehensive um, picture of any borrower's credit worthiness is based on the most relevant, accurate, and complete data set available. Therefore, in our view, it is absolutely necessary um, to, to promote the sharing of positive data. 
it is especially very important for um, all the refugees um, coming to Europe um, for very young people um, who have no um, credit um, history. For them, it is, for example, necessary that we know positive data, for example, um, like um, contract data, for example, if they have a telecommunication contract, this is absolutely necessary to give them access um, yeah, to, to um, have and to have um, yeah, the possibility um, to get um, loans, for example. The use of positive data is empirically associated with lower incidence of non-performing loans. The World Bank expressly recommends that credit reporting system should collect positive data, and therefore it should also be implemented in this directive. Um, the mortgage credit directive and the um, EBA guidelines on loan or origination include also positive data as a relevant factor for, for verifying the prospect and ability of consumers to meet their credit obligations. So um, let me um, conclude. Um, consumer protection and data protection are not always in line. We have to balance out it. And um, from my point of view, this can not be leave um, to the law enforcer. Um, we should implement what data um, are allowed to process. And um, from my point of view, we need the possibility to process positive um, informations um, like contract informations, yes, to um, have an accurate credit worth, worthiness assessment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ola. Um, Augustine, what are your views on the credit worthiness assessment proposals? Thank you. There's actually a lot to say about this and not enough time. Uh, what I can start with is that um, we, have, um, we think that the, the Commission has done a pretty good job in the, um, in the rules on uh, credit worthiness assessment. Uh, we cannot forget this is the safety net um, to prevent that uh, consumers um, uh, getting in, in trouble against uh, over indebtedness and, and of course here what is important and someone has said uh, before quality over quantity uh, the quality of the credit worthiness assessment um, depends also entirely on the data that you obtain and since we are talking about um, data in this uh, in, in, in this part of the discussion i think it's important um, to bear in mind that uh, not all data is um, financially relevant and we think that there should be a limitation on what data can actually uh, be used, especially because new technologies offer possibilities, countless possibilities to access data of consumers, um, including, for example, interactions on social media. I remember a couple of years ago, even Facebook tried to uh, secure a patent um, over the uh, the use of uh, of um, of data from the kind of network of the of a given of a given user to identify. Um, it's uh, credit worthiness. <laughs> so this is uh, something that is, um, of course, undesirable um, from several perspectives because this can lead to discrimination and exclusion. And while um, credit can be an important means for people to access um, goods or, or, or services, uh, and while we ask to have clear rules in place, it's also important to bear in mind that um, people are able to access to these forms of, of financing on the basis of their actual and accurate financial situation. And that also it's important um, in order to identify which are the financially uh, relevant data that can be used. Um, and in this regard, it's true that the GDPR is in place. Um, it's a horizontal um, legislation. We regulate the legal basis for the collection and processing of, uh, of personal data, as well as uh, special categories of, of data, but does not include a specific provision when it comes to financial services or financial data. Um, so in this regard, I think that um, the uh, commission proposal does not um, over, um, 
overlap but complement the, the 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 GDPR. Um, we will go even one one step for, further and basically trying to define what should be considered as uh, uh, financially um, uh, relevant, uh, relevant data. And also we cannot forget that the technology also offers opportunity to obtain this financial relevant data. So if you think, for example, uh, open banking, uh, that's kind of the easiest way that uh, one has to access um, data from the bank account of the consumer, which really reflects the financial um, situation of the, the person seeking for a um, for a credit. Uh, so in, in, in this regard, the technology put forward possibilities, but what we need to make sure is that those possibilities are the ones that reflects the, the real situation of consumers and does not create a, a profile that is uh, inaccurate and at the end of the day leads to a flow a credit worthiness assessment. Thank you, Agustin. Um, so also some additional points related to the data, maybe uh, David, we have heard now, uh, of course, also quite a few uh, compliments for your work, but nevertheless, there are still some open issues. Um, what are your views on those? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you again, Willem, and thank you to all the panelists. The, so the idea, we live in a democracy, so it's interesting to hear the, the discussions and criticism, and the, at the same time, it's a proposal by the commission done by human beings therefore it's it's not infallible but there are mistakes and things can be improved so of course this is this is, we take the criticism not as personal but as ways to improve the the ultimate goal which is indeed to ensure a high level of consumer protection while at the same time ensuring and fostering the cross border uh, dimension of consumer credit so uh, so uh, we take we take that point and there's no need no need to feel sorry for us now with regards to credit worthiness assessment, let me start. So this is this is. It, it, I will spend some time. I will be. I will try to be as elaborate and clear as possible without taking too much time. The starting point is the Court of Just Justice in Luxembourg. The Court of Justice in Luxembourg has numerous times highlighted the importance of credit worthiness assessment. It has highlighted its importance especially since first the consumer is the weaker party when compared to the credit provider and secondly that a, a thorough credit worthiness assessment is important to avoid over indebtedness and uh, irresponsible lending the court has clearly stated that the obligation is posed on the consumer on, on the credit provider this is already the case now therefore whenever a creditor is providing uh, a loan today on the basis of sufficient information, a credit worthiness needs to be done. This is what the CCD1 says in Article 8. Now, this is the current legislative framework. I mentioned earlier that we have done an evaluation. Two points that the evaluation has found out with regards to credit worthiness assessment are two things. The first point, the term on the basis of sufficient information is too vague. So this is the first thing. And the second thing, digitalization. The processing of personal data since 2008 has been largely transformed or, there, or nowadays a lot of it is taking place through digitalization through automated means. Therefore, the proposal in 2021 on CCD2 try to address these two things. Now, on, let's start on the basis of sufficient information. And again, what I mentioned earlier, we are going to a evolution, not a revolution. Why? Because what we have done is we have looked at the mortgage credit directive and we have tried to implement the useful parts of the credit of the mortgage credit directive to qualify what we mean by sufficient information. However, let me make it a point. What we have in Article 18 of CCD2 is a functional relationship. Therefore, it has already inbuilt in itself the element of proportionality. Why? Because it is one thing if a creditor and a consumer are meeting for the first time. Therefore, it's a, fair, it's a one thing. So the amount of data and the length of data and the data categories required if the creditor is carrying 
out of credit awareness assessment for the first time on a consumer, while the same, same relationship taking place in third, fourth, fifth time would require a lower level of uh, data points. Therefore, the functionality, this proportionality in, is inbuilt in Article 18 because there is no one size fits all approach to uh, processing of personal data for creditworthy purposes inbuilt in Article 18. So there is this functionality, this proportionality. The second point on digitalization. We have seen, and this is something which, uh, which is documented, that when you have automated uh, decision-making processes, sometimes this might lead to non-transparent processing. Of course, what we have done, and again, in the spirit of evolution, not revolution, is to look at the GDPR and borrow from the GDPR without prejudice to the actual application of the GDPR, ways and means of making this possibly non-transparent processing of personal data as transparent as possible. This is why, for example, you will see paragraph six, where we introduce the possibility to request human intervention. Therefore, this is what the commission provides. Now, of course, we could have, we have seen, and I think some of you have already mentioned the EBA, the European Banking Authority's uh, categories of data. That list is helpful, but it is not an exhaustive list. Therefore, those categories of data can help banking authorities, banking, banking, uh, banking credit providers, but it applies to banking providers. Therefore, there we know also that there are non-bank credit providers. So extending, just copying and pasting the list, which was non-exhaustive into the legislation, was an avenue that the commission looked in, but ultimately opted not to uh, take it up. There was also the discussion on positive and negative data and on, on how far on data basis the commission has not gone into such detail on what to regulate specifically because in the evaluation we found that we found out that in databases there are differences in the, in how personal data and how far personal data uh, can be used especially when accessing someone else's database therefore while there has been this ambition by the commission to make sure that we respect the, um, the, the judgments of the court and making sure that there is fair and open and transparent uh, processing of personal data. At the same time, we have not gone as far as regulating at EU level the actual use of databases. Thank you, uh, David. Uh, Prizi, you wanted to uh, respond? Uh, yes, I, I just wanted to react to uh, well, something that was said. Um, someone said that uh, based on the Hugh Hugh start uh, 2021, probably the one third of uh, the population was under the level of poverty. I think that credit and poverty should not be mixed um, because, uh, as we can see in France, uh, we have a, a decrease of over indebtedness while there is an increase of poverty. Uh, and poverty, it is more related to economical issues. Uh, the sanitary crisis has been huge, had a huge effect on consumers and their, uh, their poverty. And credit is something else. So not just, um, the, the, the credit is not just for poor people. Um, there are over, kind of people that are also using uh, credit. Um, so, so when you say that the, the, the credit worthiness is a safety net to prevent over indebtedness, um, just remind that um, people that provide credits, um, we take no benefit uh, from uh, over indebted consumers. So when we make a credit worthiness assessment, it is positive and we then grant the credit and this financial situation of the consumer at the time of the credit worthiness is good. But you, as you know, there is life events like uh, divorce, uh, health issues, loss of job. And in 90% cases, it is the, 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 the drop down of financial situation is due to these life events. So um, again, uh, the credit worthiness assessment when uh, credit institution provide credit is good. The consumer is in capacity to repay the loan, but for unexpected events, 
uh, this consumer may uh, have uh, uh, difficulties in repaying the loan. So um, credit worthiness is a uh, 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 right tool, uh, but uh, it will never prevent in 100% of indebtedness because it is due to, uh, to ev events and uh, effects from, from outside, I would say. Thank you, uh, Prisia. I understand that Augustine wants to respond because, of course, you raised this point. <laughs> yes, uh, I think, look, we, we agree that um, a, the great worthiness assessment uh, uh, is, is not going to prevent any type of indebtedness because there are circumstances uh, in life, in society, in, in, in the economy that are um, unforeseeable. So, for example, uh, three years ago, we could not imagine that today consumers will be paying uh, such a high energy bills, for example, as a result of the circumstances that we are we are we are living in in uh, in Europe, we could not think about people four years ago or three years ago people losing uh, their jobs because of the of the pandemic. So of course there are all these 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 events that 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 has that have an impact. But if we don't have a strong and a solid credit worthiness assessment, not only for now but also for, for, for the circumstances in which in, in which we are we are living and we have a more lighter approach, for example, for a small, a small uh, uh, amount, this doesn't prevent them people to getting, for example, multiple small loans that then they become much more difficult for them uh, to repay independently of these uh, life events that we um, the, 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 the we that we mentioned. Um, and and while it might be true that in, 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 in France, you know, the over indebtedness is, is, is decreasing, what we're seeing is that poverty is increasing in, in Europe. Um, and we will start seeing the effects of that in the next years when people won't be able to pay their, um, their to honor their obligations. Um, so from, 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 from that perspective, I don't think one thing uh, excludes uh, exclude the other. And a, a very important signal of an economic crisis that is affecting the households is the proliferation of this type of, of loans. And coincidentally or not, um, many of, um, for example, by now pay later products are being used by people that do not have access to traditional credit, um, uh, credit, uh, credit means. Um, so this is also an indication. It's a symptom of the of the circumstances in which we are in which we are living, and having a, a, a laxer approach to this will not solve the situation of these uh, of these people. Quite the contrary, um, can can cause serious serious consequences, particularly also because of the life uh, events that, that are taking place around us. So I fully Thank agree you. with you. Uh, the, the buy now, pay later, and and the credit, if it is of the same amount, should be. Uh, under the same rules and obligations. I fully agree with you. And I think, Martin, earlier already, you mentioned that uh, at least Karna was fine in having the uh, buy now, pay later under the CCD. Uh, so I think that was uh, clearly emphasized. Um, so um, I think it's also important maybe to mention, of course, it's not a preventive measure, but an ex post measure. The CCD also includes a requirement for um, each country to have uh, some sort of debt advice uh, services. So that's also in people end up in problems, not only through uh, consumer credit, but also through other uh, causes. Uh, it, it is uh, to some extent also addressed in the CCD. Um, I, we have, or we plan to still cover one last topic and it's the market impact. Um, I would like to ask the speakers to be very briefly uh, making their main uh, contributions on that is primarily on uh, to what extent the CCD leads to a distortion of the levels playing field um, to some extent might be considered not uh, fully uh, proportionate or could be made more pro proportionate uh, as well as the introduction of the pricing rules and those impact. So uh, if you could bear with us a couple of more minutes, then we have addressed all the key discussion points of the CCD during this uh, panel. Uh, David. Thank you. I will be very, very short with regards to the impact on the market. The impact assessment tried to make sure that there is a, a balanced, uh, balanced proposal, making sure that there is 
on the one hand, a high uh, level of consumer protection, while at the same time ensuring the fostering of uh, free, of the fostering of consumer credit provision. We, uh, of course, since June last year, things have evolved. We heard also today the issue on uh, the issue on the proportionality, or let's say lighter regime. What we make, what we need to make sure is, and this is also what our colleague quite rightly said from Onex that we don't come back here in three, four years uh, discussing CCD3. So what we want is finally a text which might have certain policy choices, but a text which withstands the scrutiny of the court, because if we go too much into excluding certain products from the scope, the risk is that we would be lowering the level of protection of consumers too well beyond the current level meaning the possibility of annulment by the court. Therefore, I think when it comes to the market impact, it's very important to, if we go to, if we opt for certain policy options, that these policy options do not uh, reduce the level of consumer protection currently sold by CCD1 or by the commission proposal, because otherwise we might run that risk. On the other hand, I understand that there is a will to improve the text, and as the Commission has always done, it's always willing to engage publicly, privately, with, by the, with the co-legislators or with any stakeholders to ensure that we have, at the end of the day, a legislation that which will, will, which will withstand time and more than just four or five years. Thank you. David, please. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. So, so we, we truly agree and we really welcome this uh, new Article 37 on level playing field. I think that we, again, uh, it is uh, to, to improve the text. If we really want to ensure real consumer protection, we, we must guarantee real playing, real level playing field. Meaning that every actor offering credit, credit institution, payment institution, fintech, or all of us must apply exactly the same rules and undergo the same control and sanction mechanism. So, in the end, if there is, if there are any exceptions, uh, it is the consumer who will suffer. Um, what we think necessary to improve this article is to allow uh, to a national competent authority to be given the means uh, to ensure the proper application of the rules on its territory by giving him the power of control, sanctions, but also cancellation of agreement on actors acting on its territory that will not follow the rules, uh, whether they have a European passport or not, uh, because uh, what we can see that it is sometimes the European passport uh, has a, a kind of failure on, on, on the coordination uh, between a national competent authority and then uh, in a national territory, the level playing field, it's not really um, uh, guaranteed. Um, uh, for example, uh, what we can see in Spain or in France, uh, credit institutions have to apply the CCD rules, of course, uh, but not the other actors. Uh, that are not regulated. So it, it, it creates um, a, a disruption and uh, uh, a disruption of uh, com competition uh, on the market that is really detrimental for consumers. Uh, there was also a point you, you raised regarding caps on rates. Uh, what we see it is that the Parliament would like to introduce uh, a European method of calculation, and we think that the one fits all uh, method. Well, could be detrimental because some of the member states have already reached uh, a, a stability, a, 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 an equilibrium, um, uh, knowing that they already have uh, rate caps. Um, so uh, maybe it does not make sense to introduce some unjustified changes that could be detrimental for, for some of uh, some member states. And what we think that could be really interesting is to allow uh, the Commission uh, to measure and to present a report on the effectiveness of the application of the level playing field to the Parliament and the Council, let's say um, a, a, a two years review. Uh, and uh, if necessary, um, the, the Commission could, could propose then a corrective legislative proposal to ensure a real level playing field. Thank you. Thank you, Prissy. Uh, Caroline from Amex. Yeah, I think to, to echo that, there's really two um, kind of challenges that 
may stand in the way of level playing field and more harmonization. The first would be around passporting. Um, and again, this is maybe more of a specific issue that Amex and other payment institutions would see, um, but there aren't really the same kind of passporting mechanisms as we would see in PSD2 in CCD. And again, I think it's gonna be key to make sure that those two pieces of legislation kind of speak to each other and that payment institutions in particular um, are not disadvantaged when it comes to providing different services um, across the EU. And I think the other one on caps, again, if we go back to what we want the outcome to be, and it would maybe be for a better consumer experience, a consumer experience that's clear from member state to member state. Personally, I feel that um, deferring to member states to impose a cap on the total cost of credit, which is not well defined really in the, in the draft, could lead to, again, kind of differing interpretations of what's folded into that cap and then what the cost would be. Um, so again, it, I don't think it would be a great end experience for users, but then also for providers who operate cross-border. If you know France uses one calculation, has one cap, Italy uses a different one, it could, again, kind of hinder scale and scalability um, across the single market. So I think those are maybe two watch outs as we look to achieving kind of a gold standard of harmonization um, and, and a you know, single uh, market for credit, those would be two challenges I see. Thank you very much, uh, Caroline. With this, we have come to the end of this uh, webinar. Of course, for ECRI, it was a bit longer uh, than usual, but this allowed us to discuss uh, the main or key debating to topics that are currently uh, debated uh, in the um, negotiations on the CCD. Um, so with that, I would like to thank you all for uh, participating. Uh, a special thank you uh, to uh, the panelists, David, Caroline, Martijn, Puisi, Agustin, and Ole. And I also invite you already to our next uh, webinar that will be on the uh, 5th of May, and then we will be discussing instant payments, how to unlock the potential for instant payments. If you think like, ah, this was a very interesting debate and you want to watch it again, uh, we will share with you uh, a YouTube link uh, later uh, today, uh, so then you will be able to go back to some of the points because we have been addressing many points, of course. So thanks a lot for now and hope to see you again on the 5th of May. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye, thank you. Yeah. Bye. Bye.